Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, a few years ago, I invited Susan Lee to Birmingham. Um, we both work on type 3 secretion, and I thought she'd come along and give us a lovely seminar about her exciting work on type 3 secretion. Instead, she gave us a seminar about her exciting work on the structural biology of viruses. So I'm returning the favour now. Although she would like me to talk about type 3 secretion, I'm going to talk about something completely different, which is high throughput sequencing in clinical microbiology. I could talk about type 3 secretion another day, but that's another day. So I'm recording this, so if anyone's not here, if you know if colleagues are not here, I'll put it on YouTube by tomorrow probably, or certainly by the weekend uh, as a slide cast. So I'm going to cover high throughput sequencing, look at some applications in clinical microbiology, look at two case studies from our own work, and then just leave some provocative thoughts dangling about the future of microbiology. So when we look at conventional approaches to sequencing and epidemiological typing uh, in bacteriology, uh, this is what we see. So the sequencing, Sanger dideoxy sequencing invented in the 1970s, bacterial genome sequencing taking off in the mid-1990s using a whole genome shotgun approach, uh, basically creating clonal populations of molecules in a biological system propagating them in E. coli, the vector cloning host type of arrangement. And although we kind of look back now and sort of sneer a little bit at that approach, it was highly successful, over 2,000 sequencing projects done using that kind of approach. But there were many drawbacks. It was time consuming. Uh, it was very expensive. And certainly in the early days, we're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds to sequence a bacterial genome project, uh, sequence a bacterial genome you know, equivalent of a, an Apollo mission, in, in a sense, for a bacteriology lab. Uh, and beyond the average bacteriology group, it had to be done in, in, in dedicated centers. Very onerous as well. Uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of, of sequences generated from, uh, uh, from plasmids. When we look at epidemiological typing methods, we have a profusion of different methods applied to bacteria. Uh, some of them listed here. Uh, one of the problems is that for each different organism, there's a different way of doing typing, uh, different approaches, and even from different labs and different countries, they have different approaches. And again, time-consuming, onerous, and I think one could argue that perhaps underpowered as well, because many of these traditional approaches label isolates as indistinguishable and just chuck them into a basket saying, well, you've got an outbreak, they're all indistinguishable, and that's the end of it. You can't really resolve transmission chains at the, at the detailed level using these kind of approaches. Three or four years ago, a new opportunity, maybe even five years ago now, time is passing, a new opportunity arose in our discipline, uh, the advent of high throughput sequencing. Now, this was a really disruptive technology that really changed the landscape. It meant we could do things a hundred times faster, a hundred times cheaper uh, than conventional sequencing. In fact, there has been, in this discipline, in this, in this area, a continual uh, progress since the introduction of these technologies. It's kind of like permanent revolution. Uh, and Moore's law is kicked in in a big way. We're seeing performances double probably every year uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the kind of output you get, throughput you get, and, and, and the costs are, uh, are plummeting as well. There are various technologies in the marketplace, and I don't think it's the time for me to give a general overview of these. There are some good reviews out there looking at these technologies in detail and how they work. Uh, here are some of them, the 454 approach, uh, the Illumina approach, used to be called Selexa, now bought out and, uh, and named Illumina. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about Ion Torrent later. And there are others following, and in fact, there are others already out there. Uh, so a very lively competition between these technologies. These rely on fundamentally new approaches. So in, instead of, for many of them, instead of actually growing up colonies, you kind of create a clonal template in a molecular colony. Uh, so you're doing things with chemistry rather than biology to create your colonies, your, your templates. In fact, there are some uh, technologies out there where you actually are not even... Uh, amplifying, you're doing single molecule sequencing. And there are new approaches to sequence reading. But as I say, I'm not, in this talk, I don't think there's time to go into the chemistries and the details of that. When we apply this to microbiology, to bacteriology, and to virology, and parasitology to some degree as well, uh, we have a number of approaches available to us, which can be divided, if you like, into two broad camps. 
culture-dependent approaches where we can grow up the organism we're interested in, uh, propagate colonies on agar plates, uh, pick them up, pick them and, and, and grow up enough material to uh, get genomic DNA, purified genomic DNA, and then we can genome sequence that. Uh, alternative approach is to actually not bother with culture at all, and there are two main approaches here. One is a, an approach that sometimes goes by the name of phylogenetic profiling, sometimes called community profiling, where you use a kind of molecular barcode, uh, and the most commonly used one is the 16S uh, ribosomal RNA gene, uh, which has the property of being uh, universal, present in all bacteria, but has conserved portions and variable portions. So you can amplify with primers binding to the conserved regions, pull out the variable regions, and kind of read off a barcode that gives you an idea of what kind of organisms are in that community. An alternative approach is just to extract DNA from the whole community uh, and just shotgun sequence it. So you may have a complex community with dozens or hundreds of bacterial species in, but you just extract the DNA and sequence it and sort it out afterwards. So how are these approaches being used? Well, here are some uh, early examples from virology where people have used this for culture-independent pathogen discovery. Uh, and there have been a, a cluster now, several papers, looking at this, extracting RNA from patients who are clearly sick, uh, making cDNA, sequencing that cDNA at very high depth of coverage and looking to see what's lurking in there apart from the human DNA that you expect to see, the human sequence you expect to see. And here are three examples here, uh, one looking at a, a novel arena virus in a cluster of transplant associated patients in an intensive care unit uh, and a couple of examples of viral hemorrhagic fevers uh, discovered using this approach. And Although you might say, well, it's a really very onerous thing to do, to go and sequence all, all this, uh, this, these DNA sequences uh, to get to a diagnosis. The point is that when you've discovered the organism, as they did in these papers here, you can then design specific primers, PCR primers, that work uh, in a very simple PCR test uh, and, and use that on the rest of your cases. Or you can even develop serological assays on the back of this once you've discovered the pathogen. Virologists generally are uh, at least 10 years ahead of bacteriologists in adopting these new kind of technologies, I have to admit that. But bacteriologists are also trying to do this kind of stuff. Here's a, a recent paper that came out earlier in the year looking at uh, whether this kind of pathogen detection using these uh, culture-independent approaches can actually make any difference to patient care. So here they were looking at wound infections and looking at... Uh, what kind of organisms lived in those wounds and what, you know, in a culture-independent way and trying to base their therapy on what they found. And what they, they report here is that if they implemented these personalized topical therapeutics guided by the molecular diagnosis, they found statistically and clinically significant improvements in outcome. So we're actually getting close to the turning point where I can start saying to clinical colleagues, this is making a difference. It's not just boffinry uh, and us people that like to play around with sequences. It will actually have an impact on patient care uh, in the future. Another growth area is in what we might call genomic epidemiology of bacteria, where you sequence the whole genome and then start drawing conclusions about the spread and the evolution of the pathogen. Uh, and a clutch of papers here that came out uh, or within the first year of, of this, a year or so ago, looking at, uh, looking at hundreds uh, or dozens of isolates uh, in outbreaks and trying to un uh, uh, unravel what's been going on. Uh, these methods actually having kind of political ramifications. Uh, they have been used in the investigation of the so-called Emerythrax incident where there was deliberate release of anthrax into the US postal system using genomic methods allied actually with conventional methods. Uh, it was possible to identify the source, uh, the, the, the actual seed culture that was used to produce those spores that were released into the US postal system. And they actually have the, 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 the uh, perpetrator of that in the frame. He's committed suicide, so he won't be going to trial but uh, the US government has actually closed that investigation based on these kind of analyses. 
Politically also, here we have the outbreak of cholera in Haiti uh, and the genome sequenced and it turned out that the genome of that strain was not like anything seen locally in Central America, the Caribbean or South America. Uh, it was in fact a strain coming from Asia and the finger was pointed at the Nepalese peacekeepers uh, coming from the UN and uh, since this article came out, in fact, uh, evidence has accrued more and more to say that that was actually what happened. And this has had tremendous political ramifications in Haiti uh, as to the role of those peacekeepers. One last example here, uh, which I presented at, uh, the, when I was talking at the ASM in New Orleans, so I thought I'd better show this one. Uh, study done where they sequenced the, genome of lepros the genomes of leprosy bacilli isolated from around the world, and in particular isolated from around the United States. Now, it's one of those kind of pub quiz facts that the only other animal that gets leprosy apart from humans is the nine-banded armadillo, and actually wild nine-banded armadillos in the southern United States and in Mexico are infected with leprosy in the wild. What they showed in this paper was that actually the, the leprosy in those nine-banded armadillos originated from humans, uh, it, it was the, 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 the leprosy uh, in, in armadillos was clearly a clade within the human leprosy bacilli from the New World. But they also showed that there were some cases where individuals who'd handled armadillos, people do strange things in the southern United States, you know, they go and skin wild animals and eat them and all that kind of stuff, roadkill, whatever. They showed that the, those individuals who caught leprosy had actually caught it from the armadillos that they'd been handling. So kind of weird end of the story there. So in Birmingham, we've been doing this kind of stuff now for over a couple of years. Uh, we're fairly geeky. Uh, myself and my biophysician Nick Lohman have been running a blog for the last couple of years. And you can see here Nick Lohman's entry for the August the 6th, 2009. You can see he says, I was anticipating today like a kid waiting for Santa Claus what could provide such excitement, nothing less than the brand new 454 sequencer from Roche. Uh, and to prove his geekiness, he took photographs of it arrive, arriving. Here's a picture of my colleague Charles Penn standing next to the crepe with the sequencer arriving, looking a bit like a lemon. But uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, this was the excitement that we had back then, in, 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 and, and we've had that for a couple of years. I'm now going to just give you a couple of case studies from our own experience uh, using these technologies and where we've got with them. First one is an organism called Acinetobacter baumannii, uh, which is a troublesome pathogen we see in hospitals, in associated with hospital-associated infection. It's a gram-negative bacillus, um, and it is commonly multi-drug resistant. Uh, and there's just two agents really that are, for most, in most cases, are the reserve agents we have to treat this organism, uh, colistin and tigacycline. But in fact, we're moving towards pan-resistance. So there have been reports of strains which are not treatable with any agent that we have available. So this, uh, this organism is probably closest to what some people have called the post-antibiotic apocalypse, where we start seeing organisms in uh, hospital practice that we have no effective antimicrobial agents for. It's associated with wound infections and ventilator-associated pneumonia. Uh, also, some, in some cases, it, it can invade the bloodstream. We get bloodstream infections. One strange thing about it is that it, it was seen uh, a lot in returning military personnel from Iraq and is still seen uh, in returning personnel from Afghanistan. Uh, at one stage, it was nicknamed the Iraqi Bacter, uh, and there, there are patient advocacy websites describing this as a, as a terrible problem and, uh, and the fact that the military personnel were not getting the treatment that they deserved and so forth. Um, in the UK, all the patients, all the military uh, casualties get repatriated to Birmingham. Uh, we have the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine there, so we have a lot of experience there. And both in our own local experience and from uh, write-ups elsewhere in the world, there's clearly transmission uh, seen from military to civilian patients in the healthcare environment. There are some problems. It's a hard to identify organism. There are a couple of so-called genomo species, it used to be called 3 and 13 TU. They've now been given uh, Linnaean binomials uh, as Pitii and Nosocomialis. These are actually impossible to distinguish phenotypically 
from Baumannia, even though when you do DNA DNA hybridizations, they appear to be uh, distinct. You can identify outbreaks and the strains causing outbreaks using a variety of methods, but within an individual outbreak, you can't really get below that and start saying, well, who's been giving this to whom, where is it spreading, what's the mode of spread, and so forth. It's hard to identify the resistance mechanisms, and we don't really understand much about pathogen biology in this organism, although I'm not really going to say much more about that. So we looked at a number of questions. Can we use whole genome sequencing to detect differences between isolates with an outbreak? So when conventional methods are saying they're all the same, they're indistinguishable, if we sequence their whole genome, can we actually detect anything? Uh, and if we do detect any differences, can they actually give us any clues about chains of transmission, who's been given what to whom? Can we see how resistance emerges in, in, within, a, say, a, a given lineage? Um, and uh, and uh, perhaps a broader question, can we actually see what might be a good definition of a species within the genus Acinetobacter uh, using conventional approaches, what's been called the species up to now, and what else we might see uh, when we look at genomes. So starting with the genomic epidemiology, we, we had an outbreak in Birmingham in 2008. Uh, we had a number of isolates that were indistinguishable by current typing methods. We've written this up, just a screen dump there of the of paper. Um, and what we did, we used 454 genome sequencing, whole genome sequencing of six isolates. We then looked at single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, between those uh, uh, genomes. Uh, we took a great deal of care to make sure we weren't fooling ourselves. So there is an error rate with these sequencing technologies. And when you're looking for well, like changes of one in a million, your error rate is equivalent to the kind of level of changes you're expecting to see biologically. So we took great care to filter out anything that might have been misleading. And then we validated the SNPs we did see by actually amplifying the region and sequencing it with conventional Sanger sequencing. What did we find? Well, we actually found only three loci in the genome where we could see SNPs. Um, we polarized the, the, the change by looking at a completely unrelated genome that had already been sequenced somewhere else. Uh, and so we said the ancestral state of these three loci was CAG, and then we called out these SNPs. Now, when you look at that, you kind of think, well, so what? What does it all mean? We then try to uh, superimpose that on time and space aspects of the outbreak. And what we see is that there were these patients in the intensive care unit in a six-bedded unit. There was one patient who spent a little bit of time on the main intensive care unit before moving into that six-bedded unit. And there was one patient here, M4, uh, out on the trauma unit. Now, if you look at this, you can see that there are three patients who actually have indistinguishable genotypes, even when you've sequenced the whole genome. M2, C2, and M4. Uh, now, M4 had nothing to do with any of the other patients, and so we couldn't really initially interpret that. We thought, well, that does, what does that mean? We're not sure. But you can see that this... Uh, M2 patient was a, in an adjacent bed for just under a week uh, next to this patient C2, and they have identical genotypes, the C2 getting infection later. So on the principle of parsimony, parsimony, we concluded that there was a transmission event here from M2 to C2. <coughs> Actually, when we dig down into the records, we found also that M4 and M2, both military casualties, had been evacuated from Afghanistan and followed the same care pathway during their evacuation. So we do think there is an epidemiological link, but they both got infected before they came into the hospital uh, uh, from a common source or one from the other. Now, some of you will be saying, what a waste of time. What a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Sequence all these genomes just to tell us that one patient in an adjacent bed caught it from the other patient. You could have told that anyway, couldn't you? But we didn't know at the outset, when we did this, what we were going to find at all. We didn't know if we'd find any differences. We didn't know whether the differences would be interpretable at all. We didn't know whether we'd find hundreds or thousands of differences that couldn't be placed in any kind of framework at all. So we were encouraged by this um, and, and continue to work in this kind of work. We've actually got funding now from the MRC to do more of that kind of stuff. We're looking at some more outbreaks now. Another study we've done with uh, colleagues in London, collaborators in London, in the HPA and the, the, the Royal London Hospital and, 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 and Barts, is looking at uh, isolates from a patient 
single patient before and after treatment with tigacycline. Before treatment, the isolate was sensitive, the, the lineage was sensitive. After treatment, it became resistant. So these were both sequenced, uh, and what we found, you know, we found more SNPs than we had in the previous, in our outbreak. We found 18 SNPs between them. Again, carefully filtering out things that might be false positives. Nine of them were non-synonymous, i.e. affected coding regions, and one of them affected a regulator, or part of a regulatory cascade, a, a gene ADS, which is already known to uh, regulate resistance uh, and efflux in this organism. So this provided us with an explanation of how it had become resistant uh, at, uh, at one level. But we actually found something interesting as well, counterintuitive. Normally you expect when you look at something that's become resistant that it's actually acquired more DNA uh, or it's acquired SNPs. What we found here is that actually in the later uh, isolate, there were parts of the genome missing compared to the previous isolate. Uh, three deletions there. And one of those deletions actually took out part of the gene MUT-S, uh, truncating it. And what we uh, propose has happened is this has led to an increase in the mutation rate within that lineage, uh, which has been a necessary precursor for the emergence of resistance. In a sense, this is parallel to what you sometimes see in cancer, where you get loss of DNA repair before you get the emergence of, um, uh, of fully uh, invasive neoplastic lesions. Looking at phylogenomics of species within the genus, we've, we've genome sequenced 13 isolates from nine species, including seven type strains, and we've been uh, drawing trees. This is work in progress, looking at various compar comparative metrics uh, and trying to see what we see in terms of uh, phylogeny and the congruence of the phylogenies. In fact, most of these things agree with each other, so it kind of suggests that there is a kind of robust idea of how these things are related to one another. Curiously, though, the, the kind of thing that's used as the, as the industry standard for this sort of thing, the 16S uh, gene sequence, is the one thing that isn't congruent, so that's a little bit worrying. And we've been looking at uh, species-specific genes, and basically the idea is that perhaps we could draw up a taxonomy of, bacterial, of bacteria that just uses genome sequences and ignores the phenotype and ignores all those strange things that you're asked to do according to the, the, the code for taxonomy and bacteria. Um, this is just to illustrate the point 16S uh, trees, somewhat different in, in some places from what we see with other uh, genes and what we see with the whole genome alignment. So here uh, we've got Nosocomialis, which I mentioned, one of these genome species, clustering quite nicely with Baumannii, whereas with the 16S it doesn't. So it, it does suggest that looking at the whole genome, you're getting a much more complex picture than if we looked at single genes. We've also been trying to tease out how many gene, uh, genes do we see that are specific to each species. Uh, can we actually devise new molecular assays that would allow us to distinguish the species very easily just by PCR or even by phenotypic methods? And what we're finding is that it depends on the species, on the, on the clade you're looking at, as to how much difference you see in terms of the number of genes. So for nosocomialis, we've got 19 uh, genes there. For radioresistance, there are 50 genes that are only found in the radioresistance and not in any other Acinetobacter. But for some lineages, we don't see anything that appears to be specific to that lineage and diagnostic of that lineage. So again, we're getting to see a complex picture of what it means to be a species within a, a bacterial genus. Okay, slight change of gear now. Um, back in, in, in February, our lives changed, my life changed quite dramatically because I won a competition. So this new technology, iron talent technology, was coming into to, to Europe. They'd introduced it to the US. They wanted to bring it here. They put out a competition. 150 entries, including mine, and two of us won an iron torrent. So I was very pleased. I announced this on my blog here that we had this iron torrent and we we're going to get this instrument. Iron torrent technology is a new kid on the block, if you like, in terms of uh, high throughput sequencing. Uh, it's uh, what we might call a benchtop uh, sequencing instrument. It's about the size of a, of a laser printer. Um, it, it's kind of got this playful 
sort of design here with kind of PlayStation uh, symbols on the front there. It's even got a docking station there for an iPod so you can charge your iPod up. Uh, when I first saw it, I thought you can use the iPod to control the instrument. In fact, you can't. It's just, it's just a gimmick. Uh, you can decide for yourselves whether you think that's uh, cool or whether you think it's completely naff. Um, and this, this, uh, what this, you, you use here are these chips. Uh, you load up these chips here. These have millions of wells in them, read sequences, and uh, the, these, these chips detect the release of protons. So in a sense, they're a massively parallel pH meter. Um, but un underneath the pH meter, uh, integral to it, is microchip technology. And one of the things that I, I well, two things they say. One is that they are the first post-light sequencing technology. So most other technologies are relying on release of light. They're saying they're post-light, they're just detecting protons. <laughs> the other thing they, they say is that because they're using microchip technology, they plug directly into Moore's law, and we can expect relentless improvement over time. And to be honest with them, they, this is the one platform where they have actually delivered on their promises uh, in terms of relentless improvement. About three-hour run time and about £500 cost per run. So at the moment, you, if you're talking about bacterial genomes, you're probably talking about £100 per genome. If what they say is true, and I have no reason to believe it's not true, by the end of the year, we'll be probably down uh, to, to, to maybe half that, to £50 a bacterial genome. So this brings me to my second case study, number two, E. coli. So uh, for those of you who are not bacteriologists, just to say this is biology's premier model organism. We know more about this than any other organism. Uh, the history of basic research on E. coli has been written up in a very accessible way by Carl Zimmer here in this book. It's a gut commensal as well, though. Uh, it lives in all sorts of animals, mammals, uh, kangaroos to cattle. It's a biotechnology workhorse. Uh, most insulin-dependent diabetics are relying on insulin made in E. coli. It's been promoted also as a probiotic. And there's a couple of, uh, of sound bites there which kind of put E. coli in its place as the prime organism in biology. Unfortunately, it's also a versatile pathogen, infects many hosts, different organ systems, a whole range of things in different animals. In humans, it can infect the gut, it can infect the urinary tract, it can cause bloodstream infection, it can cause meningitis, and among gut infections, it's very versatile as well. There are a range of different so-called pathovars that have different ways to cause diarrhea, different kinds of symptomatology with them. And in fact, Shigella is now recognized as uh, a subdivision of E. coli, so that's included in the mix as well. Now, uh, this summer just gone, Germany came face to face with a very unpleasant E. coli outbreak of a particular serovar, 0104H4, uh, striking in from May through to July. Over 4,000 cases in this outbreak. Uh, over 40 deaths. Um, it was linked eventually by epidemiologists to sprouting seeds. Characteristic feature of the outbreak, unusual feature, was that there was a very high risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, where you get damage to platelets, clotting disorders, uh, you get uh, uh, anemia, uh, you also get damage to the kidneys, and in, in worst cases, you can get brain damage as well. Um, so this was much, much higher risk than, than we'd expect for such an outbreak. And for some reason, females seemed particularly at risk as well. So that the, in, in terms of the total number of cases, about 55% were female. The ones that got hemolytic uremic syndrome, about 65%. And I don't think there's a clear answer as to why that might be the case. One possible explanation is that real men don't eat salad or don't eat sprouts. Uh, and maybe the females were eating that while the men were eating the steak. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. It, you can see here, it's, uh, from the geog geography here, it's uh, primarily in northern Germany, but it was uh, transmitted, you know, people moved around, and it, cases were found all over Germany. In fact, in uh, 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 several other countries, uh, around a dozen other countries, including the UK, uh, suffered cases in people returning from Germany. This just shows you the epidemiological curve of the outbreak, uh, peaking uh, around the third week in May, and then slowly petering out. Um, and you can see here that just a very high number of HUS in comparative terms, around a quarter of the cases or more, uh, actually having HUS. So 
This guy here, Herr Dr. Holger Rode, was at the center of this outbreak. Uh, he's based in Hamburg um, at this Universitätsklinikum Hamburg Eppendorf. He's a jobbing medical microbiologist. He's not a genome sequencer, he's not a sequence gazer. Um, and he was at the middle of it all and he thought, well, maybe we've, we've got this unique asset, this, this, these isolates in front of us. What are we going to do? How are we going to make sense of all this? So what he did was do an unusual thing. Uh, and those of you of a certain vintage, my age and over, will recognize what you do in that situation is you call International Rescue. So he called International Rescue. And we all know what happens when you call International Rescue. Uh, Thunderbirds are go. And help came. Okay, it wasn't quite as dramatic as Thunderbirds coming down to help him, but what happened was that he sent uh, one of the isolates, not in Thunderbird 2, but in a conventional aeroplane, off to BGI Shenzhen, uh, the uh, big, large uh, Chinese Genomics Institute, and they had just acquired an iron torrent as well on trial, um, and they thought, well, we'll sequence this with iron torrent and, uh, and see what we find. They did an inspired thing, though. They sequenced it on iron torrent and immediately released the sequence data that they produced into the public domain onto a, an FTP server. And this is where well, my biometrician Nick Lohman came in. He immediately saw this, and he happened to be at a, a, a bioinformatics epidemiology conference at the time. And he said, oh, look, they've released five runs of iron torrent data. Uh, it, doesn't, you know, it wasn't clear what the restrictions were, but... Um, Shall we crowdsource some analysis? And then he went off and he did a, a de novo assembly. He was in the right frame of mind to do that because we just got our iron torrent and we'd just been playing around with iron torrent data ourselves, trying to assemble. He worked out how to assemble the data in the most efficient way. So he got gone on and did that, um, and uh, also was set up at the same time was this GitHub wiki, a, a kind of a repository for that kind of data. And so within 24 hours of its release by the BGI, we had the genome assembled. Within two days, days it was assigned to an existing lineage. Within five days, a strain-specific diagnostic test had been released. And within a week, there were over two dozen reports on this uh, uh, open source wiki about the biology and evolution of the strain. So something quite remarkable being kick-started by BGI releasing the data and then Nick analyzing it and, and, and calling people to do it. Some of the details here, well, within a day of Nick doing what he did, this guy, uh, Mike Feldgarten, sometimes goes under the name of Mike the Mad Biologist when he's blogging, uh, and he is a bit mad in both senses, crazy and also quite angry a lot of the time. But in this case, he was actually very useful to us. He looked at the, uh, the genome, and he did some virtual MLST using a conventional approach of taking out conserved genes and looking at the sequence of them and comparing it to a database that already existed. And he said, actually, despite a lot, a lot of people at the time were saying, oh, this is something completely new, we've never seen this before. He said, no, actually, there was something like this uh, about 10 years ago uh, in Germany uh, associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome, just like the outbreak strain. Um, so this was an interesting reality check on what was going on. And a few days later, we really got this big burst of international activity, the crowdsourcing spanning at least four continents, uh, Mike in the US. Uh, we had people like David Studholm in the UK came in and joined in the effort, uh, Marina Marenrique in Spain, Kat Holt in Australia did a lot of work on this, and people were working it both at BGI and in Hong Kong uh, looking at the data. So it really was an international effort. Um, one uh, study that uh, David Studholm did, uh, I think two days after or three days after Nick had released the stuff, was to actually look at all the existing E. coli genomes and do a comparison. And what he said was, ah, this is most closely related to this strain E. coli 55989. Uh, it turns out that that, that lineage, five, that strain 55989, came from a, a lineage known as the enteragrative lineage of E. coli uh, uh, pathovar. Uh, which is quite unexpected. Normally we expect hemolytic uremic syndrome to be associated with what we call enterohemorrhagic lineages of E. coli. So that was an interesting finding. Uh, Kat Holt looked at further at the virulence factors associated with these enteragative uh, lineages and found that there was something rather unusual here, that uh, it had 
a particular um, fimbrial cluster, a cluster of adhesins encoded in, in, in one of the plasmids, uh, that had only been seen once before in all of the strains from, from this particular pathovar. So that was an interesting finding as well. And as I say, within uh, a week or so, the page is full of two dozen or more entries, people from all around the world, people with all sorts of, you can see just by looking at the surnames, we've got English names, Spanish names, Polish names, we've got names from the, the Islamic world, all sorts of people coming together uh, to do this, using uh, social media such as Twitter and blogging and, and the wiki uh, to collate their data. This was picked up, in fact, by some of the major journals, the Nature uh, blog site blogged on this. In Science magazine, they actually published something about it in the, in the actual magazine itself. Uh, so it, it caught a lot of attention, the fact that these analyses were going on in real time and being reported to the world in real time. In fact, there were other efforts going on to sequence the genome behind closed doors, if you like. Uh, and these two papers were published uh, one in on uh, the first group was from Göttingen. They got the first paper out in the archives of microbiology on the 29th of June. So quite a remarkable effort there, less than a month really from the centre of the outbreak, or just over a month from the centre of the outbreak. Um, and then another group uh, 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 based in Munster actually then released a paper into PLOS One. Now I pointed out to Nick. Uh, Lohman, I said, actually, all this stuff you're doing with blogs and Twitter, you're just pissing about and you should do some proper work. A few tweets and blog posts do not equate to a peer-reviewed research publication, and that's what the Research Excellent Framework tells us we have to do now. That is our only focus in life, so stop mucking about and get on with some real work. He said, don't be such a grumpy old man, uh, and we actually contacted the Germans and collaborated with them on writing this up and with the, 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 the guys at BGI. And so we wrote up a paper for the New England Journal of Medicine, included a case study of a family outbreak. Uh, I said, well, we have to describe the, the journey, not just the destination. There's no point in just writing another genome paper. We, uh, we have to describe all this crowdsourcing, so we did that. There were problems because of this openness of the effort. Who do you include as authors? Who do you bring in and who do you leave out? Uh, um, and, and we did have some discussions about that. The other thing, of course, is that because it was all being done in this dis distributed way, we wanted to be absolutely certain we could trust everything, so we repeated everything in-house uh, to make sure that it was, uh, it was entirely kosher. So our paper came out on the July 27th, uh, 2011, uh, in New England Journal, um, and we went back to back, in fact. We didn't realize this at the time, but uh, about a week beforehand, there was a fourth effort going on using a different technology known as PacBio, uh, a Danish-American collaboration that also re re uh, resulted in um, a paper describing the outbreak strain, but also a number of other related strains, including that 55989 lineage uh, as well. As I say, we concerned about authorship, and we came up with a compromise, which was that the crowdsourcing people were named on our paper as the E. coli uh, crowdsourcing consortium, uh, but they weren't on the front page, and I was a little bit concerned about that. But luckily, when it went into uh, PubMed, uh, PubMed actually was able to, somehow they have a way of retrieving the information, and they got named as, in the special field as collaborators. So these four individuals who we, who we thought had made a special contribution to the work actually got uh, their, their, their name recognized in public as well. In terms of takeaway messages, well, from this outbreak, it's clear that infection still represents a threat even in the most advanced societies. You know, Germany, one of the most advanced societies on the planet, and this is what happens uh, uh, to that society. Um, clear that pathogens don't bother with passports, not a new strain. That was something seen in Germany 10 years ago. But in fact, in the meantime, there have been something very similar, apparently, seen in Korea. Closest genome sequence strain, I didn't say this, but that 55989 actually came from the Central African Republic in the 1990s. So isolated from a patient, uh, HIV positive patient who had chronic diarrhea. It's clear that this German STEC came from a lineage, uh, these enteroagrative lineages, which are thought to circulate in human populations rather than come from animals like EHEC. Uh, and so that was one important takeaway message from looking at this in detail. 
We also can see that bacteria evolve quickly. We have virulence factors in E. coli jumping from one lineage to another. So this general audience haven't gone into the details here, but basically what we, we know happens is that this lineage acquired uh, a phage encoding the sugar toxin, which is the central toxin in, in these organisms. Um, and, and that was what we found when we started looking at the differences between um, uh, this uh, uh, outbreak strain and 55989. Um, it became clear that you know, people used to think of these pathotypes or pathovars of E. coli as very fixed entities, kind of platonic ideals, if you like. It's clear that that's not the way nature works. Pathotypes overlap, they evolve, we mustn't get rigid in our thinking. And one worrying finding in this was that this organism, this strain, was actually drug resistant. It produced this uh, broad spectrum, extended spectrum beta lactamase, uh, CTXM15, even though nobody was using antibiotics to treat these patients during the outbreak. Not clear where that selection for antibiotic resistance had come from, and it's a worrying sign that really antibiotic resistance is out there every which way, everywhere, uh, in a very worrying way. Did we, in terms of the kind of sociology of science, have we changed anything? Well, we coined the term open source genomics for this effort and said it was a propitious confluence of high throughput genomics using these kind of high throughput technologies, liberal approach to data release, the fact that BGI released their data, and these crowdsourced analyses going together. Um, and I, we think, I think it's clear from, from this analysis that things like blogging and Twitter despite me being very negative when Nick first mentioned this, they can augment usual channels of academic discourse. We weren't the first to say this. Uh, uh, there are the crowdsourced science projects, and uh, Jennifer Gardy in, in Vancouver did a very interesting TEDx uh, talk uh, last year where she spoke about what she called public health 2.0 and pointed out that similar kinds of things have gone on with the, the, the recent pandemic flu uh, outbreak. Uh, have we broken the mold? Uh, is everyone going to do this kind of open access, open source, everything hanging out type of science in the future? I, I think that probably for public health emergencies, for outbreaks, yeah, I think we will have to do this in the future. That will be the expectation that people don't hold their data, they don't hide it and so forth. I suspect for ordinary science it's going to go on as ever, that people will keep their lab notebooks themselves until the day of publication. Uh, but who knows, things will, may change. There's this old question about citing or citing, you know, do you have, put stuff on blogs, uh, will that, if you put stuff on blogs before you publish it in a peer-reviewed journal, is that going to stop you getting it published in a peer-reviewed journal? This guy here, he's called Inglefinger, he was a uh, previous editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and he had this so-called Inglefinger rule, which is that if something had been published anywhere else, it could never appear in the New England Journal of Medicine. Have we actually shown the finger to Inglefinger? I don't know whether we have or not. You can argue that all that data was out there in the public domain in, in, in June, and it was, we got published at the end of July. But of course, the actual paper, the package we presented, the way we packaged it up, was a new thing, so it wasn't quite republication. But it, it shows that uh, even these most conservative journals, like the New England Journal, are actually open uh, to change in this regard. Some people would say, well, you could have worked out a lot of this stuff just by doing a few PCRs, uh, looking for target genes. Well, genome sequencing actually brings some advantages here. It brings open-endedness. So if you didn't know what you were looking for, uh, what kind of genes there might be there, you can still find that. It's universally applicable, one size fits all. You make DNA from a, an organism, sequence it, it works. It gives us the ultimate in resolution. And I think a key takeaway point is that these benchtop sequencing platforms are now accessible, cheap, uh, quick, uh, uh, such that they can have an impact on real-world epidemiological and clinical problems. Uh, there are three of these so-called benchtop sequencing platforms now out there. Uh, there's a 454 Junior, there's the Iron Torrent, and just in the last week or two, a few weeks anyway, uh, we've now seen the MySeq come from Illumina. And we're seeing very lively competition between these platforms. We're expecting to see technical advances, and they are really going to come into this uh, uh, arena. So in the future, are we going to win? Wisdom of the crowd versus the mutability of microbial masses, the, the, the kind of global brain of humanity working together versus all those bacteria mutating away. 
I, I, I'd like to think that I put my money on humanity, but it will be a close call. This is us uh, just celebrating uh, with our German collaborators here. This is Dave Rasco, who brought out the paper back to back with us in New England Journal. Um, final thought then is, you know, why don't we just sequence everything in microbiology in the future? Uh, it's kind of there's a kind of fitness, a, a cl closing of the circle, if you like, in, in that DNA first was discovered in surgical pus by Friedrich Miescher uh, in 1869. Uh, and I would say, isn't it now the time that we should be routinely se sequencing uh, these kind of samples and using that as our diagnostic modality? And we just last week signed a contract, the, the NIHR, with our hospital and, and university uh, and the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine to actually take this kind of technology forward to look at trauma patients and uh, wound infections and other kinds of infections in military and civilian trauma patients. So it's going to be an exciting time for the next uh, few years on that. And that's it. That's me finished. There's my acknowledgement slide. I particularly acknowledge this guy here, uh, Nick Lohman, who's done a lot of the analysis I've spoken about. Thank you. We've got questions. Thank you, Anton.